copy of God's Word to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. We're actually going to finish up Jonah chapter 1 and move into Jonah chapter 2. We're actually going to finish 1 and 2 today. Yeah, I know. I know. I am. Believe it when you see it, right? Uh, I would like to, uh, if I could be so bold, and I, I never want to embarrass anybody, but we have a special guest here today with us, uh, the new owner of the theater, Brandon uh, uh, Lapham, who is here today, and he's joining us, and so we're very glad that you're here, and uh, don't want to, didn't want to embarrass you, but we just want folks to know that, uh, that we're thankful that you guys have taken this over and looking forward to having a long relationship with the Lapham family as well. So God bless you, my friend. So anyway, I'm going to ask you to turn your copy of God's Word to Jonah, chapter 1. We're in a series called... The, uh, what's it called? Oh, yeah, The Incredible Grace of... No, sorry. <laughs> the Incredible Grace of God. And we've been talking about Jonah. Jonah, a book in the Bible that some folks have, uh, have pushed off and said, oh, it's just a fallacy, it's just a fable, it's not really true. I happen to believe in the inerrancy and infallible, uh, infallibility of the Scriptures. What about you? Yeah. Amen. Good, good, good. If you don't know what those mean, see me after church, I'll explain them. The Bible is without error in its original, te original text, original uh, language. But anyway, I believe that Jonah actually did endure the things that the Bible says. Now, you know the story. A word of the Lord came to Jonah. God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to them because their sin has come up before me, and I want you to preach to them. And Jonah said, I ain't going there, Lord. And of course, this is the South Carolina version of the Bible. He said, I ain't going there, Lord. Uh, so he went down to a place called Joppa, paid to get on this boat, and went towards Tarshish, which was how many miles away from Joppa? Do you remember? 2,500. 2,500. You guys are great. So he could have gone 550 miles up to Nineveh, like God said. No, no, no. He wants to go... 2,500 miles the opposite direction. So you know the story. They get out there and the storm comes up, this really bad storm. And these seasoned sailors are freaking out. and They don't really know what to do. And they're throwing cargo overboard. and They're trying to lighten the load on this ship. And uh, Jonah has just gone down in the belly of the ship and fallen asleep. So the captain comes down and says, look, man, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll have mercy or maybe he'll, he'll find favor with us. And Jonah says, well, look, I know what the problem is. I've been disobedient to God. I, I, I ran off from God. I'm running from God. And the only way you're going to really fix this situation is if you throw me overboard. Uh, Jonah, not going to jump over himself, he says, you're going to have to throw me over. I'm not going to go over myself. And they're going like, no, we're not going to do that. So we're going to row harder to get our boat to shore. And we're going to try to get to where we need to be so we can be safe. That didn't work. The storm just got worse. So finally they said, Lord, forgive us for this, for harming this innocent man. And they toss him overboard. And the Bible says the storm calmed down at that point. And the last verse of John, of Jonah chapter 1 in my Bible, now you may have a different translation. Uh, and that different translation uh, may not even have verse 17. They might include verse 17 in the first verse of chapter 2. I don't know what you're saying, but in my Bible, the last verse of chapter 1 says, But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. There was a story floating around a long while ago about a man, a fisherman, who apparently had been swallowed by a fish, and he spent three days and three nights in the belly of that fish. Of course, it was found out later that that was all a fallacy and that was all fake story, fake news. Anyway, uh, but uh, that was not true. But there was a guy just last May that was swallowed by a whale. I don't know if you noticed that or not. He was out there swimming with these big blue whales, these dolphins and everything. And this, and this whale comes up and kind of you know sucks him in and then spits him back out just that quick. But uh, he didn't spend a long time in there, but I think he spent more time in there than he actually wanted to. Well, I believe that Jonah literally spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And you say, well, how in the world can God, how in the world could that happen? Well, God can do anything. God can do anything He wants to do. And what He wanted to do here was not to punish Jonah, but to set him down so he can begin to think about his willingness to run away from God. You see, you may try to run away from God, but God's never going to run away from you. God is never going to give up on you. He's going to continue to seek you, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So it says, verse 2, it says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and said, Now, I'm not so naive as to believe that Jonah had a pen and paper in the belly of the fish. Okay, I, probably, I believe this probably was written after he was puked up out on the, on the shore. But nonetheless, this is what his heart was saying while he was in there. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. 
From inside the fish, he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and, he, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the, de into the deep, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing, just hear the words here, the engulfing waters threatened me, and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me Bar, the earth, excuse me, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Now what's the series title? The incredible grace of God. He's just admitting that when they, those people that cling to worthless idols forfeit that wonderful grace, that unmerited favor that God has for us. They forfeit the grace that could be, there, be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. May God bless the reading of His Word here this morning. Father, just teach us here. Let us understand this. Uh, let us accept it as being a prayer of, of repentance and a man who is, is seeking uh, uh, You, Father, from the, from the belly of that fish. And Father, I pray that we here too today would seek You with that same kind of desire, that same kind of passion. And God, that we would get that answer that You have for us. So Lord, just bless this time. We look forward to all You're going to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said before, God didn't punish Jonah by use of the fish. He provided that fish so that Jonah would have kind of a place to sit and soak and sour, not sit and soak and sour, sit and soak and think uh, there about what God had asked him to do. Now, I'm not going to debate with you whether it was a fish or not. I believe it was a fish because that's what the Bible says. But what I do know about this is that Jonah was praying, and what he was praying was literally the Scriptures. Well, how do we find that out? Well, first of all, I want, to, I want you to point out here that Jonah had finally prayed, and that's what we're going to look at right here. If you were to take this passage of Scripture and begin to look at other places in the Bible that this shows that, that this prayer uh, lines up with, it'd be like this. Verse 2 matches up with Psalm 18, Psalm 30, and Psalm 120. Chapter 3 matches up with Psalm 42, verse 7. Chapter 4 was Psalm 5 and Psalm 31. Also, verse, chapter, verse 5 was Psalm 69, and, and uh, verses 1, 2, and 15. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. They all tie right back to the Scripture of themselves, saying that Jonah knew enough about the Word that when things got weird, that's where he went. You follow me on that? He knew the Word of God, and before anything even happened to him, if he'd remembered the Word of God, he would have been okay because he'd have just listened and done what God had asked him to do, Go to Nineveh and preach. But instead, God said, I'm going to set you aside and let you kind of think about it. Kind of your little time out there, Jonah. You know, and we're going to put you down there and you can begin to think. And he says, I began to pray. So we're going to break this down here uh, in a very simple way. The first thing is what we see in the text here that says that Jonah was in distress. You think? He was swallowed by a fish. And I don't know if there's any fishermen in the place, but I've had to dig a hook out of the mouth of a fish every once in a while. And that does not look like a fun place to hang out. And it's not like the little cartoons that you see where Jonah's sitting in the belly of the fish. He's got a little campfire there, you know, and he's roasting a hot dog or something like that. I mean, a fish is a fish. And fish stink. And fish are nasty. They taste good, but they stink and they're nasty. So Jonah is inside a fish, and the first thing he says is, in my distress. Can you imagine? He says, in my distress. What did I do? He said, I called to the Lord. Why do we wait to get into the distress before we call on the Lord? 
You know what I believe? I believe that if we had a constant conversation with God, that when difficult times came to us, we wouldn't even really acknowledge them. God's Word is sort of like a snow plow going in front of you. And He's clearing that way out. and he's, he's making that path for you. That when you're in constant contact with Him, and I don't mean that from a technical standpoint, I mean just when you're talking with the Lord on a regular basis, when those difficulties come, He's already prepared the way for you to get through that. But oftentimes what happens is we just let God do His thing. We get off doing our own thing. You see, that's what Jonah had done here. Jonah had gotten to the place where he was just being disobedient to God. He says, well, just throw me overboard. And so this fish swallows him. And now he has time to think. So he says, in my distress, when I'm in this difficult situation that is my own doing, quite frankly, he said, then I called to the Lord. And the Lord answered me, which is kind of cool. He was in distress. We see that in numerous places. A couple of verses that I referenced during your Psalm 120, verse 1. I called the Lord in my distress, and He answers me. The psalmist says, this is just what I do. I can talk to God when I'm not in distress, but when I am in distress, I know I can go to Him. I think it's kind of funny that when folks just want to talk to God when they're in trouble, God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise I'll what? Never do it again. And then we do it again. Whatever that happens to be. In my distress... I call out to the Lord, and I know the Lord is going to answer me. Jonah said the exact same thing. Psalm 145, another verse. The Lord is near me, near all who call on Him, all who call on Him in truth. Again, not just looking for God to get you out of a jammed up situation, not just looking for God to, to kind of uh, fix your, your, uh, your disobedience. We come to Him in truth and in repentance, and He does indeed listen. So Jonah was in distress. He said, I called out to God, and God answered me. But not only was he in distress, but this is the part that freaked me out. He was in darkness, wasn't he? I don't know about you, but I don't think there's any fish that are equipped with any little LED lighting inside of those things. If you've ever been in the ocean, in any kind of depth of the ocean, I, probably, I haven't been very deep in the ocean myself, but I see like those submarine guys that go down there and look at all those things. I mean, it's dark. And then you're inside a fish, so it's dark, dark. You know, there's dark and then there's dark, dark. He was in darkness. And he was in there probably scared to death. I mean, let's face it, he's in a fish. In complete and total darkness. You ever been in a situation like that before? You ever been someplace where there's absolutely no light? Most of us haven't. There's always something around. The fact is that there are those places that are complete darkness. And while Jonah was in there, he began to think. So look what he says. He said, in my distress, I called out the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called out for help, and you listened to my cry. You'll hear of stories of people being buried alive. Uh, Matter of fact, you know that old saying about the dead ringer? You ever heard what that's all about, You know that someone's a dead ringer? Used to be back in uh, in in, uh, in early days, they would bury somebody in the ground. They didn't have a real good batting record on knowing whether someone was actually alive or dead, so they'd put them down in the grave, and they would have a string that was tied to the person's wrist, and it would go up through the ground, and it would go up to a bell that was up on to the surface. And for, so, if they happened to get uh, uh, wake up or something, if they weren't really, uh, if they were only mostly dead. Uh, for those of you who like the Princess Bride, um, uh, if they were only mostly dead, they could ring that bell, and there'd be somebody that'd be sitting up there and be watching to see if that bell rang, at least overnight, and, and see if that thing rang. And so, so the dead ringer, would they would let somebody know. Well, most of the people that go in the ground are dead, right? But can you imagine waking up in a coffin, again, in dark, dark? Jonah was in darkness, complete darkness. And I'm sure he was scared to death. The Bible says the cords of the grave coil around me. The snares of death confront me. In my distress I call out to the Lord. I cry to my God for help. From His temple He heard my voice and my cry came before Him into His ears. The psalmist says, I was in the dark and I called out to God and He answered me. Can I ask you a question right now? Is there something you're in right now that is sort of like a fish? Something that's got you contained or consumed? 
some of this kind of got you all wrapped up and you just can't see any light. I'm telling you, my friends, you call out to God and God will answer. I will be very honest with you right now, my wife being in the hospital again, all the things that are involved with taking care of her, it makes for a very, very dark day sometimes. But I call out to God and I know God's answering and I know God's going to provide and I know God is going to bring us through this thing. If you're in darkness right now, the only thing that is going to make it right is for you to call out to the God of your faith. He said, the, graves are, the grave is caught around me. Jonah was in deep, deep darkness. So we find that he, was, he finally prayed. But then the, the next thing we find here in the text is he finally perceived. What did he perceive? Well, he perceived that he had done something dumb. Look what it says in verse 3. He says, you hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the sea, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I mean, he's describing what's going on in the belly of the fish, the waves and everything that are taking place. And that fish is just carrying him where he needs to go. He said, I said, I have been banished from your sight. What was he saying there? He said, God, I messed up. And I know I don't deserve your attention. He said, but I'm going to keep calling out to you and I'm going to keep talking. Louis says, I have, I, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. God, even though I know I've messed up, I'm still looking to you for deliverance. I'm still looking to you, God. So he finally perceives, what is the first thing he perceives? The depth of his situation. I have a little play on words there, the depth of his situation. Because he was indeed in the sea, right? He was definitely in the ocean. He was in the fish. He was in the ocean. It was dark. He was distressed. He was in a bad situation. He said, I am in the depths of the sea. He said, the waves and the breakers swept over me. I have been banished from your sight. He said, yet I will look toward your holy temple. Verse 5, the engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surround me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. He said, I am in the worst situation. He said, to the root of the mountains I sank down. Think about that for a second. Mountains down in the ocean goes on and on and on down to the bottom. The earth beneath me barred me in. One text actually says it was like they were jailed and they were, they, they were pinned in there and there was no way for him to ever escape. What it says there in verse 6, But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. My prayer rose up to your holy temple. I believe Jonah was just as close to death as he possibly could be. And in his crying out, God answered raised him back up. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So he understood the depth of the situation. He was in the sea. Well, what in the Bible says, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. David says, man, he says, I, I'm in the midst of it, but I'm calling out to you, God, because I know that you're the God of all things. The sea is going to be, is where Jonah is, but it's not just the sea that causes him problem, but it's also his sin. That causes him problem. Isn't he there because he was disobedient to God? The word of the Lord came to Jonah. But Jonah wanted to go someplace else. Remember the story of Moses and the people that he led out of Egypt? Remember Moses goes up on the mountain. He's going to get the Ten Commandments from God. And he's up there for a long, long time. And everybody down at the foot of the mountain began to mumble and grumble, right? They're just like, well, man, Moses taking forever. I don't understand what's going on. She was, you know, it's just, why don't you, Aaron, Moses is number two in command. Why don't you, Aaron, lead us back to Egypt? At least we'll have food to eat. Now, yeah, we're going to be in slavery. Yeah, we're going to have to make bricks and have to be beaten all the time. But at least we'll have food. We'll be familiar with our slavery. We don't know what's going to happen out here, Aaron. And then Moses comes back. When Moses comes back, they're running around with the gold calf above them, you know, and they're burning all the stuff and giving, giving uh, uh, they're, they're worshiping false gods and all the things that they're doing there that are totally, totally messed up when it comes to what God intended for the nation of Israel. So then we read in Exodus chapter 32. Moses comes to Aaron. Look what he says. 
He says, what did these people do to you that you led them in such a great sin? Aaron, what the heck? These people have convinced you to do something? What is it they did to you? Did they, did they threaten you? Did they force you? What happened? And I love Aaron's answer because Aaron's answer is so human. It's so typical. Because he comes back, he says, don't be angry at me, my Lord. He's not calling, he's not calling Moses his Lord. He's just saying master, you know, kind of thing. Aaron answers. Then he says this. He says, you know how prone these people are to evil. He throws them under the bus. Moses says, Aaron, what did you do to, 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 to do all this? He says, he says, you know how these people are. They're prone to evil. He goes on and says, they said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. He'd been up there for so long, they just kind of just said, well, I've had enough. I'm, we're we're, we're going to go back to what we're familiar with, even though it was dumb to do that. He said, these people are prone to evil. They, they came to me and said, well, you don't even know where Moses is. Make us a God and lead us back. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. Look, look, at, this, look at this next word. This is hilarious to me. They gave me the gold. I threw it into the fire. And out came this golden calf. As if he had absolutely nothing to do with it. You know, that's the way sin often is. We want to blame everybody else for our own sin instead of repenting ourselves and saying, God, I messed up. Jonah was in there. He was in the sea, but he was also in his sin. And he finally had to come to that realization. And he said, when he finally admitted that, what does it say there? But, but you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, Lord, God, you found Mercy on me. So the depth of his situation, but also we want to look at this. The danger of his surroundings. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The danger of his surroundings. Obviously in a fish, in the ocean, on and on, pretty bad stuff. We read in Psalms 118, verses 9 through 12. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. You can take princes out there and put government if you want. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarm me like bees, but I did and they died out as quickly as they as burning thrones. In the name of the Lord, he said, I cut them off. What did he do? He said, regardless of my surroundings or my circumstances, I continue to go forward trusting in the Lord. In the name of the Lord. And the Bible says that the name of Jesus, what? Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is indeed Lord. The danger of his situation. He was in a fish. He was in the sea. He was in his sin. And he was in trouble. But God hurt him and he says but you brought my brought me my life up from the lord <clears throat> he says when my life was ebbing away look what it says you lord and my pra uh, you lord and my prayers rose up to your holy temple the third thing i want to point out to you here is he's finally perceived that he just perceived that uh, the delight of his salvation what does it mean to be saved the forgiveness of your sins turn away from your sin and to turn to God through faith? Jonah finally comes to that point because look what he says there. Verse 8. He said, those who cling to worthless... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. When my life was up in way, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose up to you to your holy temple. He said, I'm going back to that which I should have been involved with being with my relationship with the Lord. Couple of places that we see this same kind of thing, but I call to God and the Lord saves me. Psalm 51, verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. God is the one that gives us the salvation. When we get feeling down and 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 uh, and uh, gloomy, we begin to say, you know what, Lord, I, I want you to restore in me that that spirit of when I was saved and how I how I was uh, was at peace. Lord, re restore to me the joy of your salvation, and re and to grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He says. Jonah got to that place in the fish. Which brings us to our final point here. Jonah finally prayed, Jonah finally perceived, and finally, Jonah finally praised, or finally proclaimed God. Look what it says in verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols. What kind of worthless idols do people cling to today? Anything tangible. Some folks tied to their religion. Some types folks are tied to their possessions. Some folks are, are tied to anything that takes priority over God can very easily become or can become an idol. 
Because God has got to be the first priority. If you're going to ask Myra Kay what the priority in our household is, God is first. To her, God is first before me. To me, God is first before her. That's just the way it's always been. And it'll never change. The priority must be God. Anything that we prioritize over God becomes an idol. Those who cling to worthless idols, look what it says, forfeit the grace that could be theirs. What does it mean to forfeit? To give up. To give over, right? They forfeit. God's grace is available to all who will call upon Him. God's grace, God's unmerited favor. God's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace stands for. We know that God has provided Jesus Christ as forgiveness of our sins. We know that. And as a result of that, He gives us His grace. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us freely. The idea of forfeiting that, giving that over, is what people do when they try to trust in something other. Remember the sailors that were calling out to their own gods? And did you notice that their gods didn't answer anything? So the captain comes down and he says, Hey, Jonah, pray to your God. Maybe he'll uh, look favorably on us. And of course, when Jonah was thrown overboard, the the seas calmed down completely. You see, the God of the Bible answers prayer. Any worthless idol is not going to answer anything. It's not going to answer anything. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be there. So he finally prays. Let me tell you this. Grace forfeited brings emptiness. When you reject the grace of God, I don't care what you try to fill your life with, it'll never be full. It'll never be satisfying. It'll never be filling. Because only with the grace of God do we have life and have it abundantly. Empty grace... Or, uh, grace forfeited brings emptiness. What does the Bible say? Isaiah twenty six ten. Though the grace is shown to the wi- though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Now, what do I mean by that? What does they mean by that? Not what I mean. God provides for human beings all the time. Doesn't he? I mean, every person lost or saved still can breathe air, and the only reason we can breathe air in and out of our lungs is because God says so, right? So even though the lost world sees God's hand. They refuse to learn from it and consequently don't have that righteous life that God wants. Isaiah says that in 26. He says, he says, they do not learn righteousness. Even in the land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. We see that all the time in public figures who have rejected the God of the Bible, have done everything they can to push God out of any public environment, any public square. And then they wonder why things are so messed up and so jacked up. They forfeited the grace. And consequently, they've got an empty life. They're trying to fill it with everything they possibly can. But it's not satisfying. It's not fulfilling. They'll never learn what it means to be filled with God's grace until they come to know the God of the Bible. Let me point this passage to you here out of Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 through 6 2. The Bible says the law, that is the law of God, was added so that trespasses may increase. Now, he's not saying that the law has caused us to go against God. The law exposes us to when we've messed up. In other words, the Ten Commandments and those things that we read, those things teach us when, and show us when we're contrary to what God has. However, he goes on to say, but where sin increases, what does it say? Grace increases even more. So when our sin is there, God says, look, I'm going to get your attention. You may have to spend a little time in the belly of a fish. But I'm going to get your attention. But I'm going to still watch out. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? What a dumb question. No, by no means. We died to sin. So we can no longer live according to sin, can we? How can we live in it any longer? That's not saying you're not still going to mess up on occasions, but when you do, what's your response going to be? Lord, I'm going to call out to you. I know I messed this up, and I'm sorry. Grace forfeited brings emptiness. But, this is the last thing we'll leave you with. Grace found brings everything. Look what he says here in the text. He said, but when, but I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. God, when I get out there 
I am going to give you praise. I'm, going to, I'm giving you praise now, actually. With a song of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Now, God knew his heart at that particular time, right? A lot of folks will say, well, God, I'll start listening to you if you just get me out of this problem. And then we don't. And I think God knows that, okay? So don't think you're trying to pull one over on him. But in Jonah's situation, he understood he was in peril. Uh, he was in peril. He was in trouble. And he had to get his heart right with God. So he said, God, you told me to do this. I'll do it. Look what he says. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah got to the place where he understood that God's incredible grace was the only thing that he could rely on and count on. And when he came to that point, what does it say in verse 10? And the Lord commanded the fish, and I know you don't like this term, and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. God delivered Jonah from where he was to where he needed to be. And in, the time, in between those two times, it gave Jonah the opportunity to think. Some of you here today are still in a fish. I'm not saying a literal fish, but there's something that's encapsulated you, something that's got you in a place and God's trying to get your attention, but you're just not willing yet. He's saying, I'm giving you an opportunity. Think about this. He's just waiting to let you out of that. As soon as you come to that point, say, God, I get it. I get it. Confess, repent, and turn to God. That's what it says. Jonah's decision was to follow God. What is your decision? So, Pastor, you know me, man. I'm a, I'm a God follower. Good. But I'd venture to guess that some of us here are struggling a little bit. That thing that's kind of kept us, keep us in distress and keep us in darkness, swirling around with all the things that are going on in our minds and just can't seem to get a breath. God says, I am here waiting to deliver you. One quick story and then we're going to go. There was a lady that came to her mom one day and she said, Mom, things are just not going well for us. She said, her marriage was in trouble. They were financially in trouble. And things just seemed like one thing on top of another. It just never seemed to get right. She says, Mom, I just don't know what to do. Well, you know, most parents would want to go and give some long, drawn-out thing. She says, come with me. And she walks into the kitchen, and she takes out three pots out of the, out of the cupboard. She fills them with water and puts them on the stove. And waits. Not saying a word. The daughter's sitting there like, what's she doing? Water comes to a boil and then she takes a carrot, an egg, and some ground coffee beans. She put the carrot in one pot. She put the egg in the next pot. She put the ground coffee beans in the third pot. And then she waited. Didn't say a word. About 20 minutes later, she turned off the heat, pulled out those, that carrot, put it on a plate. Pulled out the egg, put it on a plate took out the, 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 the coffee and, and put it in a, in a cup. She said, all right, now I want you to touch that carrot. She touched the carrot. It was real soggy and kind of thing, you know. She went to the egg. She said, now I want you to peel that egg. She peeled all the shell off the outside, and that egg was all hard-boiled. Then she said, just wait for the coffee right now. She said, what did you notice about the carrot? She said, it's just a carrot. She says, no, no, that carrot went into the boiling water hard and, st and stable. But in the midst of that boiling water, it became soft and soggy, became weak. The egg, on the other hand, was very fragile and had that hard outside. But when it got into that pot and began to experience that boiling water, it began to harden on the inside. He says, now I want you to take this coffee. He says, I want you to take a sip of it. So she drank the coffee. She said, mm, it smells good. It tastes good. She said, what's the difference between these three things? She thought for a minute. She said, well, the carrot and the egg, they were subjected to the boiling water, and the boiling water changed the carrot and the egg. But the coffee that was subjected to the boiling water, the coffee changed the water. It made the water different. 
See, that's what you've got to do. Are you making a difference? Are you being impacted by the things going on around you? The egg and the carrot reacted to the boiling water, to the problems that they had. The coffee changed the situation. She said, that's what you've got to do in your life. Jonah was now going to change the situation in his life. And when he acknowledged that to God, God put him back on the trail that he was supposed to be on to begin with. We're going to quit there. Think about that. Maybe God wants you to make a decision here today. If he does, we'll talk. Let's pray together. God, we know that the happiest people in this world don't necessarily have everything. They just make the most of everything that they have. And I pray, Father, that we would just remember that. That our situation, whatever it happens to be, is not forever. And God, we're not alone. Jonah, when he was in the midst of that belly's fish, gave him an opportunity to think. Lord, I pray that we'd start to think now. Instead of waiting until we're in distress and darkness. God, that we begin to, to build that relationship with you and trust in you in more and more things. I, I can't stress that enough to our folks, Lord. I pray that you would stress it as well. God, we never know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. You do. So God, we pray that we would listen and that we would decide here this morning to follow you faithfully. God, you are so good. And we thank you for teaching us today. We're not defeated. We're delivered by the incredible grace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I just want to thank you for tuning in. My name is Jeff Noble. I'm the pastor of Four Winds Church in Northville. We're meeting at the Marquee Theater right now, located at 135 East Main Street. We're just a simple church that loves the Lord and loves each other. If you want to get back to the Bible, learn how to live your life, and uh, invest in faith, family, and freedom, we invite you to come and join us at Four Winds Church. Uh, you can go to fourwindslove.org and check us out there. Or just come check us out at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Again, 135 East Main Street. Have a blessed day. In our world.